Between 1867 and 1913, there were no less than 40 attempts to pass bills and resolutions in the House of Commons in favour of women's suffrage. They were all either defeated, given insufficient parliamentary time, ignored or blocked by the government. The early women's suffrage bills had failed because they were private members' bills. These are bills proposed by individual MPs rather than the government, and as such, they are not guaranteed the necessary time to complete all of the parliamentary steps required for a bill to become law. This meant that women's suffrage bills, even when they had a majority of votes in their favour, failed to become law because of a lack of parliamentary time. Only a government-sponsored bill stood a realistic chance of becoming a law. How then to convince the government to introduce such a bill? For the suffragists, the answer was to continue to argue their case through patient lobbying, petitions, marches, and other law-abiding campaigns until they had convinced the government that the majority of women wanted the vote and would use it responsibly. For Mrs Pankhurst's WSPU, the answer was a campaign of deeds, not words. A campaign that would be impossible for the government to ignore. A campaign that would not meekly ask the government for the vote, but demand it through political action. What deeds did Mrs Pankhurst have in mind? Initially, the suffragettes took to organising marches and demonstrations, much as the suffragists were doing, campaigning in by-elections against government candidates and heckling ministers at public meetings. The latter certainly challenged Edwardian notions of femininity and respectability, but none of these tactics were in themselves criminal acts, or even, for that matter, new. Before the formation of the WSPU, the radical suffragists, which included the Women's Franchise League, also founded by Emmeline Pankhurst, and the Women's Emancipation Union, had already adopted more confrontational tactics, drawing inspiration from the labour movement. Some argue that the distinctive form of militancy adopted by the WSPU started in October 1905, when Christabel Pankhurst and Annie Kenny interrupted a Liberal Party rally in Manchester, demanding it endorse votes for women. If the interruption of male politicians by women was not convention-breaking enough, while being forcibly removed from the hall, Christabel spat at policemen, deliberately inviting arrest and generating much attention in the process. While the WSPU would not be the only organisation to deliberately break the law in their effort to highlight a greater injustice, the Women's Freedom League and Tax Resistance Leagues being two other examples, no other movement became so closely identified with militant tactics. However, the form militancy took varied and changed over time. A key turning point came in 1908. In February 1907 and June 1908, large-scale suffragist and suffragette demonstrations failed to convince the new Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, that the majority of women wanted the vote. Emmeline Pethick Lawrence, a leading figure in the WSPU, wrote that summer in Votes for Women, We have touched the limit of public demonstration. Nothing but militant action is left to us now. In 1909, Christabel Pankhurst, Mrs Pankhurst's daughter, coordinated a new campaign that included breaking windows, setting fire to post boxes, and even attempts to set fire to the country homes of government ministers. Not every member of the WSPU engaged in this new form of action, though, and it is unclear how far the leadership was responsible for some of the acts, even if they subsequently praised them and certainly incited them with their inflammatory speeches. The WSPU also continued to practice the older forms of militancy, such as public demonstrations. One such demonstration in November 1910 included an attempt to storm the lobby of the House of Commons. Frustrated by the impending failure of the Conciliation Bill, which would have given the vote to around one million wealthy, property-owning women, a 300-strong WSPU delegation reached Parliament. Here, the marchers were subjected to a six-hour-long assault by the police, with reports of both physical and indecent assault on what would become known as Black Friday. While militancy was briefly suspended while a second conciliation bill worked its way through Parliament, when this bill was likewise denied the time needed to see it become law, the Pankhurst resumed militancy. For the next two years, the WSPU caused extensive damage to properties across the United Kingdom. Burning country houses, a school, more than 50 churches between 1913 and 1914, and the tea houses at Kew Gardens and Regent's Park. Mary Richardson slashed the Rokeby Venus at the National Gallery, and bombs were planted and exploded on trains and in various buildings, including a failed detonation in St Paul's Cathedral. Luck more than design or planning accounts for the lack of major casualties. June Purvis has described the escalation of suffragette militancy 
as a reasoned reaction to the government's unwillingness to respond to non-violent methods. While this certainly helps explain why the WSPU turned to militancy, the choice to do so and the responsibility for the militant campaign's consequences ultimately rests with the Pankhursts. It was their calculation that the government's desire to maintain law and order would outweigh its opposition to women's suffrage. This was a risky strategy, one that put the WSPU in a high-stakes test of resolve with what Emmeline Pethick Lawrence described as one of the strongest governments of modern times. It was a contest that the suffragist Eleanor Rathbone claimed came within an inch of wrecking the suffrage movement, perhaps for a generation.